Well, it's so good to see all of you here tonight. If you haven't met me yet, my name is Holly Blakey, and I am one of the wives to one of our pastors over at Compass Bible Church, Treasure Valley. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to meet, you, meet me yet, hello. I am glad that you are here, that you're here joining us tonight. And as you all know, you are at an event titled, Come Let Us Adore Him, that have really taken center stage for us here this year and at this event, and consider what does it mean to come and adore him? That's what we want to ask ourselves tonight. What does it mean to come and adore him? Well, if I were to tell you to just go set out and adore tonight or later this week, I, I hope that your first question would be, adore what? Because... To adore something means that you are placing adoration toward an object, right? You can't just go out and adore. You have to actually adore something. And when you go and adore something, it's because that object, it's worthy of adoration. To adore means to regard with the utmost esteem, love, and respect. And at times it even means to worship. And so adoration, it's always connected to an object. And then that object, whatever that thing is that you are adoring, it's receiving adoration from you. But tonight, I don't want to just define what adore means with words. I want to actually show you a picture of adore from the scriptures. So go ahead and grab your Bibles and open them up and turn with me to Luke chapter 7. And maybe if you don't have your Bible, but you've got... The Bible on your phone, go ahead and scroll there now. Um, but Luke chapter 7 is where we're going to spend a few minutes of time. So we are going to see a woman in the scriptures who is seen adoring Christ. And we want to go ahead and ask ourselves why. Why is she found adoring Christ? So this text, I think, is important for us here tonight. I think it's important this Christmas to pause for a moment and glean from this text in scripture. So go ahead and look down at Luke chapter six, or chapter 7, verse 36. And it says, One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. This is talking about Jesus. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair, with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering him said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debts, debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So as we just read, Jesus is invited into the home of a Pharisee. And we learn that the Pharisee, he provided no water and no foot washing for him, along with no kiss, both of which are basically the custom of the day for guests back then. It would be similar to you having a guest over and taking their coat and hanging it up and just greeting them warmly. 
And so right off the bat, the Pharisee, he's found expressing the opposite of adoration, right? I mean, there's no respect, there's no honor, there's no affection given to Jesus. But then enters another character into the story, and it's this woman. And she is described as a sinner. Apparently, she learns that Jesus is at this home, and so she grabs her flask of ointment and brings it with her, and she stands there in the background toward his feet, and she begins weeping. And her tears are falling on his feet, and so she's wiping it with her hair. And we read that she's kissing his feet, and she's anointing them with ointment. Now this is a picture of adoration. This is a picture of the utmost esteem given to a person. This is a woman who is aiming great adoration at Jesus. So there's two different people in this story. And there's two very different responses from these people. And it's all aimed at the same one person, and that's Jesus. And we want to ask why. Why is there such a big difference between the man and the woman? Why is there such a difference between their response to the same person that is standing before them both. Well, Jesus goes on to explain that in a parable, and that's what we just read. And the parable boils down to this. The person who has been forgiven much loves much. And that is the difference between the man and the woman. Because the Pharisee, he hasn't been forgiven at all. He is still dead in his sins. In fact, he sees no need for a savior. Remember I just read in verse 39, he was thinking, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. He saw her as a sinner, he did not see himself as one. Meanwhile, we have this woman, she is a sinner, but she has been forgiven. She knows and she sees that her sins are many. Her weeping, it's an expression of her deep repentance. She knows she is guilty, and so she turns from that sin, and she trusts and adores the Savior. Now, one thing that this text is not saying is this. It's not saying that if you have a whole lot of sin, well, you will just be so passionate and on fire for Christ, right? If you have a lot of sin and you've been forgiven— well, then you're the one that's going to love Christ a whole lot more than, you know, the average person around us. That would be a childish and really immature way to view this text. What it is saying is this. The reality is that every single person that has been made a new creation in Christ has been forgiven much. It doesn't matter what your sinful past was before getting saved. It doesn't matter what kinds of sins you have done. Every one of us that is a new creation in Christ has been forgiven much, and therefore we should love much. So this begs the question here tonight. Do you see yourself as this woman? Do you see yourself as a sinner in need of a savior? Maybe you're here tonight and you even call yourself a Christian and you go to church but you have never personally acknowledged that you yourself are a sinner in need of a savior. Maybe you think other people out there are sinners or are bigger sinners, but you yourself, you're pretty good, and so you haven't personally recognized, it's me that is messed up. It's me that has sinned, and I need the forgiveness that only Jesus can offer. Each one of us has been alienated from God since birth, right? Along with this Pharisee and the woman. The Bible teaches that we all must turn from our sin in repentance and place our faith in Jesus Christ. So have you done that? Have you been reborn and made alive in Christ? What is your testimony? If there's no adoration for Jesus in your life, then you are still like the Pharisee. Because adoration, it can't just be conjured up. It's a genuine response of having been forgiven much. Well, if you have become a new creation in Christ, the message for you tonight is exactly the same. Are you still seeing yourself like this woman? Are you still sorrowful for your sin? Are you still adoring Christ because he has forgiven you so much? That's what we're here to ponder tonight.
Well, I want you to think about something that's been recently going around. And no, it's not sickness. It's not hand, foot, mouth, and the stomach bug, and I don't know, COVID and fevers. It's not that. That's going around too. But the thing I want you to ponder is, many of you will know this if you're a Spotify listener, is that you can see your year-end totals for music listened to. And you can see basically your totals in a few different categories, okay? So if you're new to this, let me tell you what it is. You can see how many minutes you have listened to music in 2022. Interesting. You can see the top five songs that you have played all year long. Maybe your kids kind of influence some of those. I don't know. You can also see your top artist for the year. So, so some interesting things. And every Spotify listener basically has access to seeing what have they accumulated over the year on their Spotify account. Well, what if there was another area of life where you could see your accumulated totals? But this wasn't for music listened to. This was for your accumulated sins. What if reels were being made of you and your tally marks and snapshots of your accumulated sins were made on little, you know, videos and you got the, the top ones kind of on your highlight film? Bitterness, maybe for you that looked like 205 hours, you know, spent being bitter in 2022, which honestly, think for a moment, that's either like way too low or maybe it's too high for you. I don't know. You don't struggle with bitterness. But maybe that's way too low for some of us, right? How about anger? Looks like 453 occurrences where sinful anger welled up in your heart, which is more than once a day, which is probably a really low bar for some of us. I don't know. Or how about if you could see your accumulated moments of lust? How many different tallied up people would be on that list? How many minutes spent fantasizing about things that are not true would be for your year-end total? Or how about gossip? What if snapshots were recorded of your biggest gossip moments of 2022? What if those were recorded and played back to you for you to see in a little highlight video of your accumulated sins? Or what about disrespect to your husband or a lack of submission. 863 combined eye rolls, words of pushback, resistance to his leadership, and thoughts of how lame he is. <laughs> I mean, 863, is that too low for some? Is that too high? I don't know, only God does. Or what about the choices to withhold love and sin by omission? How many opportunities have you accumulated in 2022 where you could have extended love to someone in the body of Christ and you, because of sin, withheld your love. You decided to be disunified instead of showing love. Ladies, I hope that this feels weighty. I hope that the sheer thought of footage of you and recorded hours and tally marks of your sin moments accumulated makes you wanna just disappear or die, honestly. Because, ladies, when we consider our sin, the accumulated sin before a holy God, we are undone. We are like Isaiah, who says, I am a man of unclean lips, when he sees a vision of the Lord. We are like John, who sees a vision of the Son of Man, and in Revelation 1.17 says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Ladies, we are guilty. We are this woman. We are so incredibly at fault, and there's no getting around it. There's no convincing ourselves out of it. There's no justification. We are guilty. You and I have tallied up a record that is vast. Your accumulated sin hours and instances would probably shock you just from this one year. Just like everybody that I see posting about their Spotify numbers, they're shocked by how many minutes they listened. Your sin totals and your highlights would overwhelm you. And worse would be if we had footage of it and we decided to play it up here on this screen for the whole room to see. Like, who wants to hide under a rock right now, right? We are guilty. We are at fault. 
and we are undone. And this is what the woman in Luke 7 understood. She got it. She understood that her sins were many. And what was her response to the Savior? It was to adore him. What was her response when she realizes she's forgiven of her sins because he's the only one that can offer that forgiveness? Her response was adoration. Her response was worship. Her response was to honor and respect the only one who forgives sins. The one who would step in when we were found guilty and ashamed and undone and would satisfy our sin problem. He would solve it. How worthy is he of adoration? And back to our illustration, instead of you having tallied up lists of accumulated sins, your tallied up hours before God one day gets to be zero. Your highlight video gets to be Jesus living a perfect life and dying an undeserved death in your place. Your guilty life gets covered by the perfect life of Christ because he is your substitute if you have repented and placed your faith in him. So if this exchange has happened for you, there is no response but to adore Christ. That is the only fitting response, is to worship him from your soul. So I want you to sing out here, and I want you to adore Christ this Christmas. And with the, the rest of these songs and the lyrics that we're going to sing, I want you to engage your mind and really adore and worship your Savior. But I also don't want the adoration of Christ to end here tonight. And so we, Ben and I, have created this booklet for everybody to take home as you leave tonight. And it's going to help you basically count down to Christmas over the next 15 days, 15 reasons to keep adoring Christ. So one page to read each day with little prompts. But ladies, that is the only fitting response. We need to see ourselves like this woman and we need to adore Christ here tonight, over these next 15 days as we count down to Christmas, and of course, beyond. Let's pray as the worship team comes back up. God, we are sinful. God, we truly are undone as we think about ourselves and all that we have done that falls short of your perfect and holy standard. God, we know that there are more moments than we even realize, God, where we aren't living out what you tell us to, God, where we are falling short of perfection, God, where we are outright choosing rebellion and sin and the wrong responses and attitudes, God, and the fact that you would send your son to live a perfect life, to be born as a baby, to put on flesh so that he could go and die on the cross and forgive us, God, that is incredible. And I pray that you would help our hearts to truly just be stirred up by that truth. God, that we would be stirred in our souls to, to sing out and to worship you, to really realize that there is no one like you. You are the only one worthy of our affections and our whole hearts, God. May we seek you here tonight. May we glorify you. May we worship you. May we connect and engage with you and get our minds fixed on you. And may you be glorified. God, we can't wait for you to return and to spend even just eternity with you. God, where the focus is going to be Christ and his kingdom and perfection, God, we so long for that day. May we enjoy a glimpse of that here tonight as we sing side by side, as we think of Christ, as we worship him. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may feel seated, seated for this um, as we sing this next song. And we hope it encourages your heart as you may be entering this time of year with great hurt and sadness, maybe an unexpected child, or you've been on a long journey of keeping the faith when it seems so bleak. Know that you are not alone. Know Christ was born for you. See what he has already done through this wonderful gift of salvation. And please join along as we get the hang of it. Mm -hmm. 